so good a lesson today. Jesus calling his disciples. Uh, uh, did you ever figure out how he knew? Jesus knew, didn't he? He knows who, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He knows who wants to be a part of him, even ahead of time. Calling his disciples. How do we spread freedom all over the world? You recruit volunteers. Have you ever tried to recruit volunteers? Maybe you've been recruited. I don't know. Back when my day, they had the draft. You were recruited, all right. Today, let's see. Let's give us some examples about recruiting. NASA. Space Association. They advertise for volunteers to spend 15 weeks in a hospital bed. Now, that sounds pretty easy, don't it? I can't hardly stand a day or two in a hospital bed. 15 weeks? They wanted to see how it affected them in space, you know. A Swedish university asked for volunteers. Now, this is more my speed. To eat four cupcakes every day for six weeks. I guess it had to do with gaining weight, didn't it? I, I don't know. Here, here's, the, here's the kicker. Pennsylvania Department of Transportation asks for volunteers to drink to inebriation as long as it took to train their officers to use their field sobriety test. Ah! Which, one, which one do you think had the most volunteers? One of the strangest requests for volunteers happened several years ago when author Shelley Jackson, so I've heard that name before, she asked for volunteers to help her publish a short story titled Skin. It only had 2,095 words in the short story. That's according to Associated Press, and that's a key to this. If you can get the news involved in whatever you're doing, and they throw it on all the channels around the world, you'll get volunteers. So anyhow, that's a key. The Associated Press reported this. She wanted to publish her book by tattooing the story one word at a time on the skin of volunteers. So imagine with me now. <laughs> you got 2,095 words. It's got to be on 2,095 people. Okay. Well, get this. It worked. Volunteers get this, from all over the world offered their bodies to the project. <laughs> and, you know, I guess this is several years ago too though. But anyhow, there's, I don't know, a little, there's, there's some examples. Uh, one even had it on his toe, it. You know, <laughs> I guess it's all over their bodies. <laughs> Did you know it worked? publicized everywhere. You know, everybody was, uh, I've, got, I've got part of Shelley's book, you know. But when you stop and think about it, a small group of volunteers spread the message and the mission of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem around the world. Small group, handful of men. And they did this, this handful of uh, disciples, they did this while facing persecution. You don't get nobody for persecution, do you? Huh? No volunteers for persecution. Uh -uh, I've got enough of that without joining a group, you know. <laughs> but anyhow, while facing persecution, and they faced poverty. Persecution, poverty. Then they faced beatings. Remember Paul and Silas? They just beat them half to death stripped them of the clothes, put them in stocks and bonds in the furthest part of the jail. My. So 
This small group is going to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ from Jerusalem around the entire world facing all these obstacles. Along with that, cultural differences. Uh Uh-huh. You take somebody from the United States, send them to China, they don't know the language, and that's another one. Language differences. Imagine all the obstacles that are involved in you volunteering for a cause and having to go and spread it all around the world or wherever God leads you to do it. Seems almost impossible, don't it? Let's go back and let's look at the beginning. In Luke 10 and 1, reads like this. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70, 70, 70 also. And he sent them out two by two. Have you ever done that? Have you ever, any, anything? Good grief, I remember when in, in uh, high school, They'd have us selling things for FFA. We lived in a rural farming community and they'd send us out two by two. (laughs) Guess they got it from here. You know, and you you take the little brochures and you go out and you sell, I think it was magazines. And if you sell so many magazines, you win a knife, you know, or something like that. And, and, uh, but anyhow, that's how I started in the salesman's department. Didn't like it. Didn't like it at all. But anyhow, I sent him out two by two in the face of every city and every place uh, before his face. Now, the reason it says before his face, Jesus was coming to this place later on, but he sent the two ahead of him in this city, in this place. So get the picture now. Two by two. And, and whether he himself would come. So that means he was going to follow them. So I guess they had to t- kind of lay the groundwork, wouldn't you say? If you, you know, go and tell them that I'm coming. Go and tell them that Jesus is coming. Do we do that today? Do we go and tell them Jesus is coming today? Anyhow, therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the labors are few. Now this is 2,000 years ago. Has it changed much? Huh? Harvest is great. It's greater now than it ever has been around the world. The world is... The population has just exploded. Billions today. So, and uh, so he said, therefore, uh, pray ye therefore for the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth labors into his harvest. So that's, that's what we do. We pray for labors and workers in this vineyard. We pray God send us labors and workers in this vineyard. We don't advertise it too much because, you know, you're, you're back over here. Hey, would, would you volunteer to go with us? Go where? Well, into persecution. Uh, huh? Huh? Uh, yeah, into poverty. Huh? You mean, and, and beatings and, and jail. Huh? Are you asking me to volunteer to go out into that kind of situation? And, and it just goes on and on, you know. So we have to kind of keep that quiet, don't we? Oh, come and and join this uh, organization called Jesus Christ as followers, you know. Uh, His plan, his purpose, and and all this. Now, I'm going to tell you what. I've been preaching for 47 years, and I'll tell you this. I don't sugarcoat none of it. Because you're going to find out sooner or later, anyhow, all these persecutions are going to come because you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. You may not be an apostle of Jesus Christ yet, but anyhow, I tell them up front, when you accept Jesus Christ, first thing you do is learn this. You start learning this. First thing you do, you start getting every opportunity you can to learn what Jesus wants you to learn from his word. And the Holy Spirit will teach you all of this. And the Holy Spirit have, has many, many ways of teaching you this. There's a lot of people. I'm telling you, I'm learning all the time. I just keep learning. There's people. We, we've got the greatest educational privilege today that we've ever had. Get on that phone and get on something besides, you know, the games. 
Get on learning about God and his word and what it's all about. Pray the Lord of the harvest. Go your ways, behold, he said. Now, this is, does this sound like sugarcoating to you? He said, go, I send you forth as lambs among the wolves. Well, tell a lamb what the wolf is like. Well, that's what you're going to be like. You're going to have to face that. Eventually, you're going to face that. And don't want to get into that seven-year tribulation thing that's just around the corner for us. You know, you're talking about whew, lambs heading for the slaughter. You don't carry a purse with you. I guess, is that a billfold too? No script, no shoes. What? Well, I wouldn't last long without shoes. I don't know about y'all. I had kids in my neighborhood that went barefooted all the time, and I couldn't. My feet was tender, and they're still tender all my life. Any of you ever go barefooted and just toughen your feet up, you know, and just be able to go barefooted? I never could. I'd have to, say, I'd have to sneak a pair of sandals on. But anyhow, let's get on. And don't bother stopping in, uh, on the way and talking half the time. You ever see somebody try to get a job done if they're talking all the time? No. Don't do that. Uh, and whatsoever house you enter, first say to that house, peace be to this house. And if the, if the son of peace be there, talking about Jesus if he's already, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. In other words, if they don't receive you in peace as representatives of Jesus Christ, then you turn around and leave. And if the same house, uh, oh, uh, uh, if not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, in other words, if they receive you, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the labor is worthy of his hire. Where'd that come from? The labor is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. <laughs> Settle in, I guess. <laughs> you become a resident, you know. Put my name on the address. No. That's not, it just means that if people representing or if they, if they love Jesus Christ too, if they have the peace of Jesus Christ and they're helping you out and they're helping you out in the ministry and they're helping you out in spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and if you're a disciple and if you're on the road, but this is, this is a little more than being a disciple. I'll get into that in a minute. But anyhow... And into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you, eat such things are set before you. Remember these, these, old, these old black and white movies years ago? I've seen a story of a, a, a minister. These were ministers that get on a horse, and they ride 50 miles through the hills, you know, and the, and the woods and what have you, and they minister to people. And eventually, a week or two, they get back to where they started from. Scene one, uh, uh, the minister took his son. His son wanted to go with him. He said, okay. He took him with him. And they were at this little old lady's house. And they were eating some porridge. Uh, uh, it was, the movie was, they, they sat down to eat the porridge. That's all the woman had to give them. And uh, in the dad's porridge was a bug or something. It, it was something that the little kid kept saying, Dad, this is in a movie now. Dad, Dad, you know, don't, don't eat that. Don't eat that. And the dad went over and hit his son, you know. <laughs> Hush. And so anyhow, the dad went ahead and ate every bit of that porridge, bugs and all. And he never did tell the little old lady, you know, because it would offend her. I, I, I don't know why I remember that like this. He said, well, what's that? you know, uh, and whatever they set before you, you eat it. Don't say, whoa, wait a minute, where's the steaks? You give me the baloney. You know, don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, and into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you. All right, all right, number nine, and heal the sick that are therein. Well, how many of us that that would leave out? And say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But they had the grace and the spirit to heal people. The big, big difference than today. Uh, and it says, but unto whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you not, 
Go your ways out into the streets of the same and say, now this is tough. Number 11, even the very dust of your city, which cleaves on us, we do wipe off against you, notwithstanding, be ye sure of this, that the kingdom of God is come nigh unto you. Kick the dust off of your shoes. Have you ever had a situation like that where you just felt like kicking the dust off of your shoe? Well, there's other scriptures too that go along with the same theory. If someone don't receive you, just kick the dust off of your shoes at their door and walk on. They have no idea what that means. But I do. I know what it means. And I know what Jesus is saying here. I know what effect it's going to have on that place. Because they're in trouble and they don't know it. So don't just go around kicking your shoes off at everybody's door. All your enemies, you know, hey, there's my enemy. Kick, 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 you know, get the dust off my shoes, boy. Just wait and see what happens to you. I don't think that's the right attitude. We feel like that sometimes, but I don't think it's the right attitude. Uh, okay. Now let's notice what's happening here. Jesus has set his face resolutely for Jerusalem. You know, have you ever been that way? Have you ever had a strong motive or direction that you want to help send somebody you, you, you know, in a certain direction, tell somebody to go somewhere or you go yourself somewhere, but you're set on going there. You're going to do it no matter what. Well, Jesus Christ was heading here in these places where he sent his disciples or apostles ahead of him for. He sent his, he had his face set to go there. <sighs> let me, let me go on further. Get ahead of myself here. Only Jesus knew that he was heading toward his arrest, his torture, and eventually his crucifixion. He's the only one who knew that. He tried to explain it to him, but didn't nobody understand what he was saying, you know. But Jesus, knowing all of this was fixing to happen, looked straight ahead. He stayed focused on what his mission was. He stayed focused on what God was asking him to do. He stayed focused even knowing all of this was coming. Can you do that? Huh? If you know the whole bottom's going to fall out of everything if you do certain, certain things. Can you stay focused and go through it? Most of us change a half a dozen times. <sighs> Only Jesus knew that this would be his end. This would be the end of his earthly mission. It's now time to pass the torch. Have you ever said that to your kids? It's now time. It's now time for you to do what I've been doing. It's now time. You have to do it. Jesus knew what was fixing to happen to him. Well, it, uh, well, what if the disciples decided that they just wasn't going to go, go through with this? What if they just decided to sit down and go back to what they were doing after Jesus was resurrected? He's not with them anymore. What a shock. He got crucified. What a shock. He died on the cross. What a shock, you know. Really didn't see this coming, Lord. I was following you as long as everything was going all right. You were healing the sick. You were raising the dead, you know. You were feeding, you were making, you know, five loaves and two fishes, feed 5,000 people or 10,000 people. You know, long as everything was going pretty good, long as you was with us, Lord, then it was all right to follow you. But now you're leaving us? I don't know. I don't know if I'm up to doing this. You know, it's kind of hard times right now. What if you were here? What if you were here? Even your own people that you come to die for, even your own people refused to believe that you were Jesus. They called you the devil. They would not accept Jesus at all. The Jew would not accept Jesus. And get this, 2,000 years later, 
Are they accepting him now? Not as a nation. Nope. We still are not accepting him. But my, 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 how many Hitlers has to come to the Jews before they'll wake up? How many Hitlers has to come before us before we'll wake up as a church body around the world? How many little countries have to get in trouble from people like Russia, Ukraine. Ask some of them Christians. Ask them what they're going through. Ask them, are they about ready to throw the towel in? How many of them are laying down the cross? From what I see on TV, I don't see much of it lately, but what I seen on TV weeks ago, boy, they were still praying and they were still meeting and they were still worshiping, you know, and they were all, they're just being blown up for no reason at all because somebody decided he wanted their land. But anyhow, it's time to pass the torch. Uh, his disciples, and do you think maybe he's passing the torch to the church today? Do you think maybe he's still calling people and passing the torch to people today? I would say yes, he is. Yes, he is. He is still passing the torch. He's passing the torch to us. He's passing the torch to us this morning. He's calling people even today. Got to carry out the message. Carry on the mission. Continue to volunteer. Continue the work. Now, I believe and I, there's coming a day and it won't be very long now. I keep telling everybody, it's not going to be very long. I mean, uh, all you've got to do is be a historian to know a little bit. I studied history. I loved history. I loved history in high school. I loved history in college. And I love history today. And I study history. And I'll, I, I'm just amazed by it. it. It gets my attention. And my attention on the book of Revelation and all the prophecies of the end of the world is right in front of the world. It's right around the corner today. Don't wait and wake up someday and say, oh, Brother Larry was right. What happened to everybody? Then you'll be left behind. You don't want to be left behind. Get everything right in your life today. Accept Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior today. Pick up the torch. The torches are laying everywhere. Pick up the torch and start carrying the torch. And you've already been explained to you what you're, you're in for. And I'll tell you this, the older you get, the harder it is to walk. Harder it is to get down the road, you know. Even driving today, with all the conveniences that we have today, you know, it's still hard. So anyhow. Today, God knows how short the time is. He's the only one that knows how short the time is. But he's got a little clause in here. When you see these things come to pass, look up. Because your redemption draweth nigh. In other words, you that are carrying the torch, you that are doing the work of disciples and apostles, uh, and you're going through a lot of things today for that, you know. Uh, I can just imagine if you're still paying your tithes and gases, well, it dropped today. It dropped today. But I can imagine how hard it is if you continue doing that when the cost of hamburger meat's gone through the ceiling. Forget the steaks. Don't even start looking in that part of the counter. You know, but anyhow, I can imagine it's harder and it gets harder. And who said it was going to get any easier? Not Jesus Christ. Uh-uh. It's going to get harder. But God knows when the time is and it's almost here. But based on, he said, when you see these things come to pass. How are you going to do these things come to pass if you don't know the Bible and if you don't know what somebody that already knows it is telling you and you can't recognize what's going on in the world today? You're going to be blind and you're probably not going to carry much of a torch. You may carry it a mile and you'll lay it down because it's just too tough. 
So, what is the methods being used today to warn the world about the return of Jesus Christ? Now, 2,000 years ago, the disciples were going before Jesus, and there was a, a just in, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. And well, he was literally coming right behind them, you know. Recognize him, Jesus, the Son of God is coming. Jesus, the Messiah of the world, he's coming. He's right behind us. And then here comes Jesus walking in. And how do we know this Jesus? Raising the dead, healing the sick, feeding the multitudes, you know. Preaching to them about mercy. All kinds of ways he was helping people, not even counting saving their souls. How do you warn them today? How would you warn them today? Well, I'd recommend the original plan because it works. Send volunteers out two by two. Huh? Yeah. Either that or have a yard sale. We got a chance to talk to a lot of people, didn't we, Mom? Donnie? Yeah, we got a lot. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course... I couldn't start preaching a message out there trying to sell them something, you know. It was kind of hard. I don't know. We might not have sold nothing if I stayed out there. <laughs> you know, might have led somebody to the Lord, though. You never know. But it had been worth it. So today's methods, I'd say two by two. Go out and tell everybody that Jesus Christ is about. Well, how am I going to tell everybody, Brother Larry? How am I going to tell everybody that Jesus Christ is coming? Uh, well, I'll send you with somebody that's done been studying the book of Revelation, you know. <laughs> I'll pair you up with somebody. And then as you go out and you talk to each other, you know, uh, and you discuss the end time, you discuss what's going on and what's happening, you know, and, and how close it is. And then you, you start to, I'm going to tell you, if you send somebody out and, and one person kind of has a, uh, a knack for doing it, you know, or a talker or something like that, you know, and I know a lot of talkers, but you know, and, and, uh, and then next thing you know, you see somebody accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. What's that do for the guy that's a novice that is, just going around walking with somebody. That'll change him too. He'll start getting, he'll say, whoa. He said, well, you know, ain't everybody wants to talk to us. Expect that. Uh, the workers are few. Yeah, there's still few. Uh, so we got to pray for the Lord of the harvest. Send out workers, Lord. Send laborers and workers into this vineyard, Lord. How many of you heard me say that? How many of you heard me pray for that? Pray for it all the time. Send laborers and workers into the vineyard, Lord. And we have one objective, not to fill up this church. What is it? To fill up heaven. No, you can do a lot of things to fill up a church. Yeah. All you got to do, if you want to appeal to the multitude down there, just go worldly. And you'll appeal to them. <laughs> but you're here not to just fill up, well, if you try to fill up heaven, you'll fill up your church. So that's the way that works. But look for the real thing that you're trying to do. Send out laborers. His disciples, along with his followers, that's us today. We don't realize it. But now is a critical moment. It's a critical moment in the lives of everyone in the world. It's the lives when Jesus' disciples officially become apostles. Well, now let's change the subject here a little bit. In verse 1, where it says, Jesus send them out two by two, the verb that was used for the word sent, now pay attention to this, is the Greek word apostolou. I guess I pronounced that right. A-P-O-S-T-E-L-L-W. And it means to order one to go to a place appointed. Literally means apostled. A-P-O-S-T-L-E-D. Uh, sent out. So, the disciples are getting prepared. They're learning. They're training to go out. They haven't went out yet, but they're training to go out. Let me tell you what, once you've become a child of God, first thing you need to do is learn how to be prepared. Learn how to do the work. Learn how what to expect, learn what to say, learn how to knock on a door and present yourself. And I'm gonna tell you, 
if, uh, if something's going on in the house and you knock on the door and they don't want you around, just dismiss yourself quietly and turn around and get in the car and get out of there. Because it won't work anyhow. Unless, unless they're real sick and they're fretting over a child or something and you've got the power of the Spirit of God or the gift of the Spirit of God to lay your hands on them and heal them, then they'll love you for the rest of your life. But if they don't know that, they won't. It's a very important time in the journey with Jesus. It's a very important time in the moment of every Christian's lives. When you switch from being a disciple to being an apostle. So what's the difference, Brother Larry? In verse 1 where it says, Jesus send them out two by two, the verb used, apostle. All right. Any other situation is being a disciple. Newborn Christian, okay? Someone has just accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. That's a disciple. Someone has just answered the Holy Spirit's call for you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's just the beginning. I hate to say this because I don't know how many times and I don't put on punches with people. I tell them exactly the way it's going to be. I tell them when you come and, and maybe it's an emotional moment. I've seen that happen. I've seen people come because other people come. I've seen young people come because other young people come. And, and sometimes it's contagious. Sometimes, you know, they'll all get to come into the altar and somebody thinks, well, this is something that I need to do. And my friend and my buddy or something, they're doing that. So I'm going to go do that. No, 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 no. You do it because the Holy Spirit's drawing you. If the Holy Spirit's not drawing you, you stay in that seat. But if that Holy Spirit is drawing you, if he's trying to convince you that what's going on is for your good, and this Jesus that has been talked about is for your good, and that you don't have much time, you better pay attention. And especially if they say this is, could be the last time you'll be called. Whoop! Huh? You think that happens? Yes. Yes. It's biblical. He will not always strive with man. So, if you're being called, I'm going to tell you what. You forget everything else in your life except that calling. And then you set your face... You can do it in your seat. You don't have to do it here at the altar. This is just, I believe in public, publicly announcing that you're accepting Jesus Christ. But these altars are for also Christians to come and pray for a need that they have. And you don't know the difference. You don't know whether they're being saved. You don't know whether they're uh, uh, asking God to help them with their children, help them with their life, help them with their job, help them with everything that's going on, sickness and everything that's going on in their life. You don't know what they're praying for, but you pray with them. And if they come to ask the Lord to come into their life, his spirit to come into your life, write your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life, by all means do it. I don't care what you have to go through. Do it. So that's very important. A disciple is simply a student or a devoted follower of a teacher. Where's Jim at? Uh, what do you do in boot camp, Jim? It, what does boot camp prepare you for? Yeah, it, it prepares you for when you meet that guy across the road from you that's got a gun pointed at you and you got a gun pointed at him, it prepares you for that minute. And if you're not prepared, what does he do to you? He'll kill you. If you're not prepared to meet Jesus Christ, if you're not prepared at the end of your life whenever that may be, and you're not guaranteed of tomorrow at all, what does that mean for you? The devil will kill you and he'll have you and he'll take you with him in that lake of fire that goes on and on and on. 
think of how long eternity is. Because that's where you'll spend eternity in a lake of fire by the enemy that's got you. And the enemy is the devil. And he's good at what he does. Don't let him dupe you. I hate, I don't know how to use any other word. Did you ever get duped by somebody? Tucked by somebody? Cheated by somebody? Rooked by somebody? I don't know how many words are out there. I use duped. When Satan dupes you, he'll dupe you good. And he'll take you down the road with him. Jesus Christ is the only one that can keep the devil from having you. Don't ever leave the house without him is what I say. So a disciple is a student, a devoted follower of a teacher. Boot camp is a disciple. You're in boot camp. And I went to boot camp in Boy State. Took me through boot camp. Man, alive. Jim, the hardest part I had was flipping a coin up and coming down and hitting the bed and turning over. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Anybody else has ever been through boot camp? Man, marching up at a certain time. You hear that, you hear that trumpet go off, boy, you better get out of bed. You better already be out of bed. We were already out of bed. And that marching time comes and that preparation time comes. And I, I kept looking at the guys next to me. We went two by two. Two from every school went to uh, boot camp. And uh, anyhow, but you never got to see your buddy from school. He was always way, they scatter you out. He's way over there. The object is for you to make new friends and new buddies. And you work together in all kinds of fields of operation in that boot camp. And you better learn how to work because the, whew, uh, Jim, I think I had to do push-ups one time. You know, I, wrong place, wrong time, boy. That sergeant came in. On your face, Rouse. You, know, <laughs> you got me kidding. I thought this was, you know, good times. No, boy. Boom, boom, boom. If he, and if he comes up and puts his foot on your back and pushes down, you're in trouble. That, that's boot camp. Boot camp is one part of the battle. Preparation. But apostleship, that's when you actually go meet the enemy. So if you're not prepared to meet the enemy, I don't blame you for keeping your seat. You know, if you're not prepared to go meet the enemy, because I guarantee you the enemy's getting ready for you. He'll be ready for you. And he'll take you and just twist you in every size, shape, and form he can. Because he knows how to do it. And he don't, he don't play by the rules. He'll cheat. He'll lie. He'll steal. He'll just dupe you. Dupe you good. He'll give you something and you think you're just really getting something for nothing. And the next thing you know, he's got you. You just got to be careful. Because the devil knows how to lure you. Man, look at that old snake in the Garden of Eden hung up in that tree up there and this poor little old woman called Eve. She comes up and looks at him and I, the way I understand it, he was a pretty snake. Didn't know a snake probably. Didn't know how a snake was supposed to look. And of all things, this snake talked to her. Well, right there's the first warning signal. I don't know how many animals in the Garden of Eden talked to Adam and Eve, but boy, if none of the rest of them's talking, I'd be a little eerie the one that was talking. Well, now you are. But boot camp. Boot camp and apostleship. Apostleship, Jim, was when you met the enemy head on. Did you have some friends that lost their lives? Oh, yeah. yeah. See? So it wasn't no game, was it? It wasn't just a game going over there in Vietnam. Vietnam was bad. I lost some friends in Vietnam. And some of that, you could have the best boot camp volunteer there was, and they're still going to lose their life. But Jim, they still went, didn't they? Still went. Wouldn't it be something 
if you had volunteers for Jesus Christ, but if you just take a small following and get everybody prepared, discipled, that means being prepared, and then become an apostle where you actually hit the road. You actually go out knowing you're going to be having a door slammed in your face. Or at work, somebody say, don't be doing that here. We're strictly business here. We're strictly here to make money. Don't be mixing Jesus Christ here. You do that in the church. You stay in the church and work for Jesus Christ. You stay in the church and become an apostle for Jesus Christ. The minute you get out of that church, you forget it. Because you're in the world then. You're duped if you hear that by the devil. Because God said, whoa, I remember Brother Larry telling me one day that he sent them out two by two. Those apostles went out two by two and they went through all kinds of pain. So let me, let me close with this. Now y'all listen hard because this is hard. If you sit in church each week and doubt the power of the Holy Spirit, you can't do nothing without the Holy Spirit. You can forget it. You're not going to be able to do it. You won't last. You won't make it. The power is in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Jesus Christ. Holy Spirit in you. So if you don't do nothing, you doubt that the Holy Spirit will see you through. You don't have enough faith in him. You don't have enough trust in him. Or if you sit in church and you haven't done any acts of mercy or justice, if you haven't helped anybody, if you haven't tried to take somebody some food or some groceries that are down on their luck or things like that, if you just haven't had any uh, training or discipleship like Jesus Christ, anything that Jesus Christ would do, you ain't done none of that. If you're still like that, okay, no acts of mercy, no living in the truth, you may still be a disciple in boot camp. Even after you've accepted Jesus Christ, you're saying, listen, listen, there's got to be some evidence that you have accepted Jesus as your Lord. There has to be some evidence you can't sit on the sideline and let everybody else work and you not work. For the lost people of the world, you, you probably are still in boot camp. Not anything wrong with being in boot camp. At least you're on your way. But if your worship and your study is leading you to walk out of this church and look for someone who needs the good news and look for someone that needs the warning that today Jesus might come. And if you're not saved, you will be left behind for seven years of the worst hell you ever can imagine. Never has it been like this seven years is going to be. And then you've got to contend with the Antichrist and the false prophet who really knows how to dupe you. And you'll think, well, I'll get, I'll get saved during this time. Oh, if you won't get saved today, what makes you think you'll get saved when you've got a, a, a knife? You, you'll have your head cut off if you're saved during that time. You'll be beheaded. What makes you think you'll get saved then? Or... You can't buy or sell without a mark in your right hand and your forehead. Huh? What makes you think that you'll get saved if you're starving to death? <laughs> Dupe City. But if you're, if you're going out and you're thinking about this, I, I advise you to be saved first. Ask Jesus to come into your life first. You don't have to be at these altars. It can be at home. It can be in your closet. It can be in a seat anywhere. Anywhere. You can accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. When you do and you need a church to be a part of, come and tell me. We're always looking for volunteers.
Jesus is coming soon, then you may be more than a disciple. You may be becoming an apostle. We should all strive to do the work that the apostles in the early church did and tell others how important it is not to be left behind when Jesus Christ comes. Could be today. It's how close it is. Stand with me. Bow your heads with me. We've got time for an invitation. If the Lord has talked to you or anything, it's your seat. You just you just kneel down at your seat. You don't have to be on this front row or the seat. You don't you don't have to be on these altars. These are a good place though. Good place. But accept Jesus today before it's too late. Bow your heads with me, Father. Thank you for the lesson that you've given us this morning. Thank you, God, for all that have come this way today. Thank you, most of all, Holy Spirit, for your presence in the service, for all the good singing, God, and all the reminders, God, about today we celebrate the 4th of July, but, but God, about all the people that have made this country what it is. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for we see your moving in the government of the United States of America. We've seen this past week you're moving in the Supreme Court. And God, they did something that they were threatened with their lives over. And Father, there'd probably still be a lot of trouble just because they done what they were, not what they were told to do, but what they were prepared to do and what they were taught to do and what they knew was right according to the Constitution of the United States of America. God, thank you for blessing this service. Thank you for blessing this nation. And God, as we give the invitation this morning, anyone, God, this is the most important minute of their life. If anyone here needs to know Jesus Christ, I pray, God, that we would all rejoice in that as much as we will when the day we see Jesus face to face. And thank you again for your presence here. Send us souls for our labors and labors and workers in the vineyard. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen and amen.